When God created the world, he spoke. It was created. There was no Mickey Mouse stuff, you know. There was no trying to create a whole long list of things to get ready and all this. And the construction project, like years and years of preparation, design board, drawing board, and all this stuff. None of those. God, Genesis chapter 1, said, let there be light. Let there be light. It's light. And God created light. Let there be water. There be water. There let be lights. And uh, the small light, the big light, the sun and the moon and all the cosmos. And let there be animals and creeping plants and creepers, insects, everything. Just fill the earth. And finally, God created uh, Adam and Eve and said, and uh, God said, be mount." Uh, and then God tell everything, not just human beings, and multiply and fill the earth. Okay, so the principle is that God created the word ex nihilo. Ex nihilo means God created something out of nothing. That is God. That's how amazing, how powerful it is. I'm sharing all this that there is a transformative power in the word of God. God speaks, that word is not just uh, um, a, a message. It's not just a content of knowledge, so to speak. There's a lot more than that because it is. It carries the transformative power that is supernatural. You know, when, when, uh, when, Jesus, when, when Jesus was in the wedding, I, I think Cana or something, uh, the the bride and the, the groom bridegroom and the bride ran out of uh, wine. They love wine there, right? <laughs> so in the end, Jesus' mother was there actually. Jesus' mother, halfway through, they ran out of wine. Mary, Jesus' mother, told Jesus that uh, Jesus they ran out of wine. I think Jesus said, "Woman, why do you bother me now?" You know, every time Jesus says something, there's a cryptic message behind it, you know. But anyhow, Jesus said, let people, you know, fill out all the buckets, empty buckets with water. They fill them up. And after that, they ask the wine taster to come and taste it. They open it up. The water's, water's changed, converted. Water's changed into wine. In fact, the wine testers, the people keep the good, keep, serve the good wine first, but you keep the good wine to the last. Not knowing that Jesus speaks and spoke and there's power. There's creation power. There's transformative power. Again, um, you know, Jesus, there's one time there's a, there's a captain in the Roman Empire that, I think it's Roman. Yeah, came to Jesus and said, come. Come to my house and heal my my servant because, um, you know, it's just this servant has been wonderful and I really need your help. And apparently, in this century, century, apparently, this century is very well recognized in Israel, even though he's Roman, but he has been very good to Israel. And the people were, uh, he because he didn't come to see Jesus. He just sent somebody to come and said, Jesus, Jesus, would you come to my house to, to heal my servant? And all the the Jewish folks are saying that Jesus, you should go because, you know, this is a very good century. It's been very good to Israel and all of this. So Jesus went halfway. Centurion um, came and met him and bowed down. Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come to my house. Just speak the word and my servant will be well. Just speak the word. Did you hear? And he explained it, rationalized it that way because he said, I'm a captain. I man under me. I told under my command. I told them to go, they go. They come, they come. So Lord, you're the Lord of the, <laughs> you're the Lord of all. Speak the word. My servant shall be healed. And Jesus marveled at the faith of that centurion. And he said, he turned around and told his disciples, in all of Israel, I have not even met a, a man with such great faith like this Gentile. And that moment, Jesus spoke it, and the servant got well. See that? So my point is this. There is transformation power. This is supernatural again. In Wittgenstein, in the philosophical world, in the uh, I think 20th century, Wittgenstein is one of the big names in uh, 
um, in the postmodernism world or just before that, Wittgenstein, <clears throat> but because when he could not get a, uh, you know, when he could not get a meaningful, um, meaningfulness out of a sentence, or, um, that that any any knowledge of sentence, any knowledge that cannot be empirically verified, you know, uh, if if it is not, it's not verifiable. That knowledge is meaningless. Okay, so so that is his ob ob objection. So when you say you should, uh, you should look out for your neighbor. They cannot be empirically verified or sensory experienced at its own. He said that is meaningless. Therefore, Wittgenstein famously called ethics as transcendental because you can. It's something you can be shown, but you cannot do. You, you cannot. You cannot say. You cannot explain it. Therefore, you went ahead to exclude the metaphysical discussion of morality, or morality and God. Okay, he said God is not empirically verifiable, no sensory experienced, which I dispute on that one. Uh, and and uh, and morality, the whole thing about morality, you can't verify. It. So, so forget that. Just. Uh, so this uh this this uh metaphysics thing I can't cannot be included in knowledge okay <laughs> so so how does a Christian apologist can come in Christian we can come in and explain that you know this is precisely you cannot do it but we can because we bring in the the revelations of God into our lives to reveal to us the ethical requirements of God. That's actually empowered by His Holy Spirit. There you go. It's, we, you see, the, the word say, uh, be nice to you. Uh, do not steal, for example. Do not steal. Uh, do, not, do not kill. And do not commit adultery, etc. Uh, this is laws, external laws to so keep people in good behavior. But after a while, people got fed up, got... Difficult because there's internal power inside us that draw us into lustful world temptations and to, you just can't fight it. Every man has that problem. Every woman has that problem. So, but but we have the solution, and that's ethics. That's what Wittgenstein's correctly say that it is just impossible. That's why Friedrich Nietzsche is disappointed about God because he thinks God has less and less impact in the world. Because you look at the world today. They have problems. They call counseling. You know, Darwinism, evolution, diminish God. That's why they're throwing out all of all the textbooks about God from from the classroom today in America, and throwing out prayers. My God, what rules and reigns is whatever feel good inside you do it. Okay, this is another story, but I'm just giving it as an example. So we, we need that power. So we are telling you that what the knowledge that God gives us has a transformation power. He speaks and creates. He, God doesn't tell us, don't kill, don't commit adultery, but he actually empowers us by his Holy Spirit to not to do it. Hallelujah. And the way to do it is like Psalm chapter 1. Delight in the word of the Lord day and night and meditate upon it day and night and delight in the word of God, which which is a scripture, which is the Bible. And with a delight in it, you know, you shall bear fruit in its season. You're, you, will, you, you will never wither because your roots go deep down in, in the water of God, the rivers of God. And blessed is the man who meditate upon the word of God day and night. His delight is the word of God. Why? Because, because whatever he does, because the word of God gives you and me the power to do ethics, to, to obey the laws. You know, the world is trying to tell you, don't kill, don't steal, don't rob. If you do, put you in jail. That never works because it's ethics driven, because of the dry bones. Nobody can keep up with it. People would do it for the sake of not going to jail, not going to offense and everything. You know, and still people cheat all over the place and hypocrisies. Corruption at the highest level. Look at the Congress. Look at the White House today. I mean, things on and on. Just 
because it just shows you blatantly the blatant failure of human endeavor to be good and yet cannot be good. This is exactly what Paul said in the scripture that wretched is me. The good that I should be doing, I don't do. The bad that I should not be doing, I keep on doing. I just don't know how. I love, I long, I delight in God's, the, the law, but I can't do it. What a wretched man. That is who we are. But God says, now, because that's why we need a Savior. A Savior who gives us the power. Because when God speaks the word, he gives us the power to lift it up. So Wittgenstein has this speech act theory. Okay. So he, he finally, the second philosophy, later part, he understand that uh, he, he goes beyond the proposition view of the scriptures. He goes into scriptures now. So to include the transformative power of God, God's word in context. Now, that's it. You can read the Bible all you want for information, for knowledge, you'll never be changed. But if you read it and let dwell on it, open your heart and meditate and pray to God, the Holy Spirit come in and open your minds and eyes, eyes then you see and then you receive that transformation power. That's why Jesus said, those who have ears, let me hear. <laughs> what does he mean? Because the ears are not opened. You know, that's, a, that's why Psalmist, in the book of Psalms, Psalmist always said, pray, O Lord, open my eyes, O Lord. Open our eyes, O Lord, that we may see the wonderful things out of thy law. Why? Because there is a veil of darkness. So, Wittgenstein, back in, he's a, he's a philosopher, okay, he, he came up with this uh, speech, uh, speech act theory, speech act theory. Speech act theory is for the doctrine of Scripture. Speech act theory does not merely describe, but actually perform various functions like commanding, state, stating, and promising. So the, the word, the doctrines of Scripture by speech act theory is that the word does not just give you information. The word actually perform actions, actually perform and execute and make things happen. The word in itself. So the word... The doctrine of word actually performs various functions. So you apply the scripture, spoken word of God is not just for information only, but carries that creative power to create, provide guidance, provide life and encouragement to us. Glory, glory to God. This guy, Wittgenstein, got it. Because the word of God is not just give you information per se. The word of God, the Bible has that creative power to create and to give you guidance in life and to provide you encouragement in life in life. That's why we should meditate upon the Word of God day and night because the Word of God is a source of life and it actually gives us, gives, gives us the creation power that we, we give strength and encouragement to us. This is so powerful, so powerful, Okay. So this is what I want to share with you about the creative power of the Word of God. Amen.